everyone would love to have a secret power, a skill that makes you a hero. If you just said everyone but me, don't lie. The thing is that there is no single skill that makes you such. If you aspire to join the top 10, top 5 or 3% of the best developers in the world, you will quickly realize that what those people have in common is a particular mindset. I'm nowhere close to the top 3% of Ruby developers, but I found that constant thinking about how to improve, how to deliver high quality code with less and less effort made me a way better programmer in a very short time. There are several habits I developed over the years of programming in various projects that had a great impact on how relaxed I am and how efficient in terms of delivery, especially thinking long term. One is definitely TDD, which I will cover at some point, but today I want to tell you about the other important skill I found not so popular, but extremely beneficial. It's online documentation, and I learned that from open source contributions. Let's talk about what inline documentation actually is. The common understanding of inline documentation refers to comments placed within the code files, but that's a very big simplification. Comments in the code are just additional things to maintain, and there is a big chance that they will get out of date very quickly. The difference between inline documentation and just random comments is that documentation is structured, follows common conventions, and is kept at a minimal level. This all put together allows for a bunch of great benefits to be added on top of it. Before I will jump into the particular solutions, I would love to show you the few advantages that adding inline documentation brings to your projects. First of all, if I'm building a project or library, a component or whatever else, I can make use of ready-to-use documentation generators, which parse my code and comments attached to it and generate neat, complete websites where the whole team or whole community can easily track what's going on within my classes. One example of such generator for Ruby projects is rubydog.info, which automatically detects public Ruby gems and generates documentation pages based on the inline comments in the code itself. Here I browse dry validation documentation website, where you can easily browse through each method and class and check out what it does what arguments it accepts, and what type of value it returns. While this is neat, often you just have private repositories you work with, so you may wonder if this kind of thing is available for private projects. I have good news for you. You can generate such documentation for any repository, private, public, or local, with no effort whatsoever, having full control over sharing files with anybody in your team. I will talk about it a bit more later in this episode, but for now, let's move to the other nice benefit. One of the more useful things that inline documentation allows you to do is showing the documentation snippets of documented classes or methods when you hover over its execution. You might think, okay, but the code should be self-explanatory, shouldn't it? And I kind of agree. You may sometimes figure things out just based on the method or class name. However, in a lot of cases, you would need to visit the implementation and figure out how the code works, which adds additional effort and may cost you a bit of time depending on how often you use it and how well you know the project. If you do have your code documented, at least a little bit, then you may save some time and brain power by letting your editor figure that out for you. Let's say I have two subscription mechanisms in the system, one that subscribes via email and the other that subscribes to the YouTube channel. And then a class using one of them. Just simple at reader with initialize method and a call method that calls the service assigned to the reader. This is what happens when I will hover 
over the service variable name. And this when I will move my cursor over the call method execution. I get immediately the information about what type of class is assigned to the service reader and what the method does, which in this case, it subscribes the current video viewer to the YouTube channel. A little disclaimer here. As you can see, automatic subscriptions are not fully implemented yet, so please use the manual way of subscribing to the channel for a while yet. Even though I don't have the information what is hidden under the variable value just based on a variable name, it's still immediately accessible and it proved to be very useful quite often in my case. I don't need to visit the actual definition of the class and read through the code or test to figure out what it does exactly. And when I need to, I can just preview it in the pop-up itself. I like when this kind of stuff saves me some context switching when I feel a breath of deadline on my back. Finally, inline documentation makes the code review easier, a lot easier. If you like those of your teammates who review your code, which is true in my case, it makes sense to help them as much as possible to go through your changes as quickly and effortless as possible, as there will be a greater chance you will get more high quality feedback faster and you will keep good relationships with your mates. How does it help? Well, while it can be acceptable for me to go through the different parts of the code, grasp the implementation of the dependencies while all that is relevant for the context of the task I'm working on. People who review my code have their own tasks, often unrelated. To properly review my code, they need to go through the task definition, specs, and chances are they will forget about something, as all that code they see is completely new for them. Having then a few guides on top of class or methods can make a difference for them. If you are reviewing the code daily, I'm wondering what are your thoughts on this particular point? Now, having covered why it can be beneficial to add some of the inline docs to your code, I would love to tell you about the possible concrete solution. There are several common formats of inline documentation in your code. And what I found the most resonating with me is Yard doc, which is a tool designed for Ruby. In a very clear format, I can describe what the class or method does, why it exists, which arguments it accepts and what value it returns. There are also conventions to document custom DSL methods, private API, and a lot more if you wish. It would be tedious to go all of this on this video. So guess what? I recommend you to check out the great documentation of this documentation tool. But don't worry, if you will just get familiar with a few most basic features I already presented, it will already make a huge difference in your projects and teams. If I do have my code documented, I can generate the need complete documentation files by the yard doc command. I have here a dry transformer files downloaded. And just to show you how it works, I'm going to generate local docs for this gem. By the way, check out episode 6, where I cover the basics of complex Ruby transformations using Dry Transformer. First, I need to install the yard gem, and then I can create docs using a single command. The generator gives me a bunch of useful stats, telling me which files in my project are not documented and how much of the total code base is covered with docs. This generates a set of files where I can easily navigate through and browse them without an effort. As I mentioned before, if you create a public library, there are several engines automatically picking up your gem and generating docs for you. However, the nice thing is that even if you want to keep your code private, you can still generate up-to-date documentation files during CI builds and upload them to private servers if you wish, so everyone in your company can easily access necessary documentation. Okay, 
So if the inline docs are so awesome, why does not everyone use them? The first thing that comes to my mind is probably the most valuable point. Inline documentation, like any documentation, is one more thing to maintain. You may minimize the number of changes required on every update, as well as the risk of going out of sync with the actual code, if you will keep things simple and only document the key points, but still, it is a bit more work to be done. Then the other possible reason is the short-term thinking. I do like to make things simple and keep things simple. The only trick is I prefer thinking long-term instead of short-term. It's a big simplification in itself, but in general, I don't have the time and money to make the same thing twice, so I'm trying to reduce such situations as much as possible. This is why I write tests when I'm coding, and this is why I write inline docs while I'm coding. Not always, not 100%, but whenever I can. Then the third reason I found very popular is that code should explain itself. But here is a nice article why this can be just a hilarious joke. I totally recommend it out. It's a very nice article to read. In my opinion, it's true, but only to some extent. In academic examples, it's realistic, but in reality, code can't explain itself. Code just shows a narrow context, not explaining the whys behind it. And sometimes you just can't keep it simple. What if, for example, you will have a code snippet written in two different languages at once? Not possible? Here are a few examples of that. First would be installing GPG or any other shell library in the setup script in your project. You may often see such code in setup scripts of various Ruby projects. Inside, you may find the Ruby code that calls shell commands to set up dev environment without effort. It's usually not a big deal. If you know Ruby, chances are you also know shell, so there is no problem here. So let's move to the next example. This snippet is taken from official Redis documentation to ensure thread safe log mechanism key removal. This is a bit more advanced scenario, but here Ruby code of the Redis client calls the Lua script to make things work well. It's readable, simple code, no logic, so you may say self-explanatory. But I can't already. I would think quite a bit when staring at this snippet to figure out what it does exactly if I would see it without any kind of context provided. Now you may say, okay, but those are old edge cases, so let's find something more familiar. The next snippet is so popular in Ruby applications that I often forget that it touches the same problem of mixing two languages together. Here, the Ruby script generates a raw SQL and passes it to the Postgres adapter to perform left outer join instead of inner join. I borrowed this one from the talk about convenience versus simplicity Piotr Sornica gave in 2014 at red.rubyconf, which I recommend to check out. Custom SQLs in RISE or any other Ruby web applications is the most often seeing example of mixing two languages together. The last example of this mix I want to show you now. I implemented in the Ruby event store client not so long ago to allow for generating server-side projections that are written in JavaScript. Here, I dynamically generate JavaScript code using Ruby class and send this snippet to the server. What is unclear here? Class is very well named. It's a command that creates projection. There is only one method that obviously performs the command. But when you will look at it, you will be like, what the hell is happening here? And I totally agree. Keep in mind though, that all those examples are still very simple, extremely simple if you wish. And you can still understand what is happening, even if you only work with Ruby. But it's totally possible you will encounter more complicated examples in your projects that mix several languages together. Okay, 
You may say then that the Git history can help you or is enough to avoid such problems. Code editors give you live browsing capability of who changed what and when, so it's easy to get a context, isn't it? In my opinion, often it is, but sometimes it's also not enough. In real life, you may have a file added in one PR, but then you just run a linter on it after a few months and each line changes. Then you lose your context. Again, having comments here and there that are more static can really improve the overall clarity of your code base. So what can we do to make inline documentation useful instead of making it another piece of garbage we add to our code? First of all, keep it slim and skinny. Remember that inline docs are additional thing to maintain. If you can keep things simple, do it. Document only what is necessary and when you see it necessary. Then use existing conventions and frameworks like Yardoc to get a bunch of additional benefits. Finally, don't make it religion. Do I always add it? The answer is simple no. I add it when I have a time and mood for it, and when there is a reason to do so. I developed a habit of adding such docs, but I find that there is a lot in common to tests I write. There is a great resource from Jason Sweat about when to write tests, and I can suggest being pragmatic about inline docs too. When I would write something like a UUIDv4 generator.call, then I'd definitely not be stressed about adding an inline doc to anything in it. Inline documentation is a great tool that can bring awesome long term benefits to your team, and I find it very useful if we keep sanity around it. If you want to see more content in this fashion, subscribe to my YouTube channel, newsletter, and follow me on Twitter. I want to especially thank my recent sponsors, MVP Match, J1G, and DNS Symbol for supporting this project. I really appreciate it. By helping me with a few dollars per month creating this content, you are helping the open source developers and maintainers to create amazing software for you. And remember, if you want to support my work even without money involved, the best you can do is to like, share, and comment on my episodes and discussion threads. Help me add value to the open source community. If you know other great gems you wish me to talk about, leave a comment with hashtag suggestion and I will gladly cover them in the future episodes. As usual, here you can find two of my previous videos. Thank you all for watching, you are awesome, and have a nice rest of your day.